In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. Welcome back to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bay, along with my special guest, Robert Slaird. Good Robert, to you, good to have you back. This is not Revival Radio today, it's Revival Chat. Revival I think chat. it's Revival Chat, because we, we love to talk and we're gonna go like 18 different directions at once. So where we're gonna start today is with the ministry of John G. Lake. Our friend Joe Martin recently wrote a book on uh, the miracle ministry of John G. Lake. Uh, so let's just dive in. Okay. Um, Roberts, what stands out to you the most about John? I have my, I, my thing that I like, but what stands out to you about him? I think that one thing for me is the 100,000 documented miracles in five years. 100,000? 100,000 documented. Now, that's not his whole life ministry. That was just five years of the healing rooms wow. in Spokane. So to have something documented like that, 100,000 documented miracles in five years to where Spokane was declared the healthiest city in America at that's that right. time. And the mayor included his appreciations to John G. Lake's healing rooms in his address to the city. So that was significant to me that the healing ministry affected the city where it was declared by the national government to help this in America. And it was a cause of John G. Lake's healing rooms in the city. How do we know the 100,000 are documented? Because what, his ministry documented them? What, what they did when you went to the healing rooms is like going to the, to the doctor. Right. So you had different rooms. And they were healing technicians, I call them, or the yes. people who Lake had trained to minister healing. They were out of his school. And you went into one of the rooms and they sat down and found your story and wrote it down. They located your faith level and what they felt led by the Lord to tell you to do. And they gave you a prescription. So many of these scriptures, so much of this, so much prayer. And they begin to walk you through. And you come back next week and they walk you through. So they saw you in the beginning and all the way through to the end. And so they had the two results. So that's how they get the figure, 100,000. So it's not just a Christian evangelistically talking that we do yeah, sometimes. Yeah, exactly. That's, that was a big number when I first heard it. I thought, nah. But when I talked to his daughter, Gertrude, she was alive in that time. That's what they did. And so it is a documented that's story. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, 100,000. Is that the way Brother Hagen uh, fashioned his prayer and healing center? He had yeah. that. Well, it all started with Dowie, with the healing homes. He came healing rooms to healing school. So kind of those three progressions. And that, that was the thing that provoked Brother Hagen to do that. And he taught a lot of it himself when he was alive. He was, in, he was involved in it. Yeah, yeah amazing. So <coughs> there's always the story of uh, John G. Lake. Now let's talk about what he had to deal with. He had to deal with the plague, you know, pretty, exactly. the bubonic. Plague. Well, there's lots of stuff we can talk about him. Yeah, well, let's start. Go ahead. Well, when he was young, he was a Methodist. And he got in the healing ministry by accident, almost. His wife had gotten very ill. I think she was shot, is the story. I think Joe tells that story. And he sent the telegram to Dowie. He sends one back, she'll live and not die, and she gets healed. So the people begin to come toward him. Well, your wife got healed, fix my, my daughter. My. Right. So he didn't know what to do. So he packed all of his bags up with his wife, and they moved to Zion. And uh, was on the board of the church for a few years before he left because of Dowie's uh, wrong identification in his life. He thought he was Elijah, and so he began to go off. That's when Lake left. But the other thing with Lake, he lived on a street that across the street was F.F. F. Bosworth. So he lived on the same street in Zion. Bosworth was a part of the band. He was a part of the board. And uh, so Parham comes and can't preach in the city because they don't like tongues and all that stuff. They liked healing, but not all that. They go Just so everybody understands, we're talking about Charles Parham from Topeka. Topeka, yeah. yeah. But okay. um, he, um, they got to the house meeting. Yeah. Charles Parham comes and does the house because he can't do a public meeting. They hear about Azusa Street and they get on a train and go out to Azusa Street. It has been three glorious services a day, every single day for over three years. You could hear the sounds of angels singing. You walked on the dirt floor of the church, but a ground fog with heavenly smells was everywhere, and people walking in it were healed. 
I hurried to Grand Central train station. It was a half mile away. I saw people get off the train and fall in the spirit, speaking in tongues. The train people said this had been happening all day long. Some said they saw a bloodline around Azusa Street, and when you crossed the line, you were healed. People fell to their knees and accepted Christ right on the spot. When I turned around to look, I could see the fire coming out the top of the Apostolic Faith Mission. Fireballs from heaven came down to meet fire coming up from the building. It's like the burning bush the Bible talks about. I can hear people shout, I can see, or I can hear now. I see lame carry to Azusa, and they go dancing out. One night, Elder Seymour prayed for a man with a stump. We all saw this. His arm instantly grew out. It was amazing. First, the bone showed like a skeleton, then muscle around it, and even at the tips, there were fingertips. We all just praised the Lord. There's a great picture that I found in Gertrude Reich's photographs, or Lake's photographs, of Seymour Parham Lake at Azusa Street, and that's where they got familiar with the Holy Ghost. And that was the journey there that led him to eventually go to South Africa and build the apostolic faith mission that's still going today. So what's the connection, uh, in, or is there one, with uh, the Welsh revival? Was there, because didn't, wasn't he talking back and forth to uh, Evan Roberts at the uh, Welsh revival? Well, I don't know if Lake was, maybe that's something that someone else said, but I know that um, there were people out in LA that were corresponding with Evan Roberts, yeah, because they wanted a revival there. And Evan Roberts would write them and tell them to keep praying and seeking God. So there was that, I'm aware of that communication. But when the revival showed up, the people that prayed it in didn't participate in it, which is always an interesting part of revival history. The folks who prayed the revival in normally turn out against it or don't participate. And the reason for that is they, when they pray, they get a picture of what it's going to be like. And it's not always what they're going to be like. It's because even when we pray, we think that's how God's going to answer this prayer. God, we do that naturally. And when it don't go that way, they resist it. And plus, the revival in L.A., Azusa Street, was not like the Welch revival in this sense. It had more of the, the Holy Spirit tongues and gifts than Welch did. Yeah. And so that was the conflict. And plus, evangelicals were the ruling Christian body at that time. So can you imagine having a revival mission led by an African-American, which was the lowest kind of person at that time in American history, and he was blind in one eye, and mixed races and genders all going together, and they're preaking in tongues, and they're vibrating and shaking. You know, we, we accept that today. I grew up with that. Sure. When that started, can you imagine what the Presbyterians, the Baptists? Oh, yeah. So their reaction, you have to understand, is not all... Uh, just hostility. It was, it was a deep concern that it was error. And so it was very passionate persecution. And you can, I can imagine people shaking and vibrating and doing trances, and that just looks bizarre to these people. So I have compassion when people come to my meetings or meetings like Full Gospel their first time. I get why sometimes they're scared or they think we're all crazy because it is a whole different ballgame when people are reacting to the Spirit is allowed. Wow. Yeah, I'm... I'm <laughs> Well, let's be real, even today, there's a lot of those that, uh, and there's been a lot of error, you know, that we've seen a lot of error over the years. What is, um, now, if you had to nail this down with John G. Lake, where his, the man of faith that he was, what do you think contributed to his faith? Because he was, to say he is bold doesn't even come close. I mean, he was way out in front, you know, to the, you know, what would you contribute that to? I think two things. I think, only three. One, the desperate need of healing that he had in his family, and he got it. So he knew by experience in his own family. When he talked about when he was a kid, he was familiar with caskets, funerals, nurses, and doctors, because so many of his family members died. Yes. So he had the pain of death, the pain of sickness, so that always drives people, how do we solve that? When his wife and others begin to get healed, he saw something, and that was a conviction, like, I know this works because my wife was dying, this person, and they're not dead now, this happened. So he, then he sought out who was doing it, which was Dowie at that time. So he went and learned under the dominant heel evangelist of the time that was greatly successful. It's just said he, he erred at the end, but he was, he was similar to Wigglesworth in the way that he would minister. He was kind of abrupt with people. Yep. 
And uh, so, so many of those pioneers are abrupt. So he learned good healing doctrine under, and, and how to do it under Dowie. He had enough individualism to say, even though I love you, Dowie, and you are a great man, but you're an heir. And he walked out of the era season and kept himself clean and pure. And I think that um, he was a man of the word. Seeing drove him to scripture, not to just the practice, but he wanted to find out what's the foundation of this. And he built a strong human spirit to go with this strong gift, yeah. which a lot of people don't do. They just ride the gift and suffer the private life. All right, let's expand that a little bit. Riding the gift, you know, break that down. Well, your gift will work when there's a, when God gives you a gift, healing, prophecy, whatever, and there's a demand from the crowd and a demand in the spirit. It'll operate and it'll op because it's the gift of God coming through you. And when it shuts down or when it's finished, it doesn't leave you, but it just goes dormant for it. You have to do what you have to do privately. Why do healing evangelists die sick? They don't spend time taking care of their personal faith to get their healing themselves. They you think it's because they rely on their gift? They rely on the gift and they, they see the gift working for everybody else and they assume it'll work for them, but they have to practice everything that we do privately. Just because you have a gift doesn't mean you're exempt. And I think Lake practiced, he did what he was supposed to do privately that gave him that kind of strength. People that don't do the private stuff ride the gift. And one day the gift will become their enemy because then they, they can't function without it functioning all the time because that's how they find their life, their joy, their peace. They've not built strength, they've not built word, they've not built prayer. So the torture of what you do under the anointing comes at you privately when the anointing is lifted. The hardest time for me as a kid to learn how to do this is when I got done preaching at Word Explosion, these big events. And it's great. And when you get back to the hotel room and it lifts the backlash of what you did under the anointing you have to deal with out of your own personal strength. If you've not built a strong human spirit, you are tortured. You will do things. This is why guys commit adultery. They get into alcohol or drugs. They're trying to find a way to take care of the pressure. And you can't do it that way. And that's, that's what they do. A lot of guys, before they were saved, how did they medicate themselves? How did they get through trials? And if you don't build a strong spirit, you won't go back to what you did in the natural to get through that moment of anxiety and pressure. Because it's what you knew. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what happened. So that's what I mean. When we're riding it, you're, just, you're enjoying the gift. You're not, you're not doing the lifestyle next to the gift. You're just riding it, and then you're partying, you know, relaxing. And then you've got to come back and say, listen, if you don't do this, this is going to torture you. And this will cause a problem. So that's how I would describe that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's great. I think it's, uh, I think it's really the, um, for those of you watching, this is what you and I need to, uh, we have a way of, Robert's putting people up on pedestals, yeah. good or bad, you know, that we want to honor the gift and honor what God does, but we put people on a pedestal not realizing they have to deal with the same yeah. issues. So that's, it's a great, uh, great word that you bring yeah. out. Everybody's human. Oh, how great your gift is. They still put their pants on like everybody else. And you got to take care of your body, your mind, your spirit, your family, your money, all of that. If you don't take care of it, there's going to come a problem. So is there anyone um, that comes to mind when we talk about that did it right, that other than John G. Lake, that uh, that well, was committed There are several that? you can look at. You can look at another historical figure, Smith Wigglesworth would be one. Right. A more recent one would be Kenneth Hagin, which I think we're both familiar with. Sure. He he lived that life very powerfully, and he lived it publicly. He would talk about it. Because I think he was trying to say, folks, I, I was aware of the voice of healing guys. He used to tell us, the yes. voice of healing preachers, great healing gifts, but then they messed up lives and they only lasted for that revival and they were gone into backsliddenness after that. And he saw that and didn't want that to happen to his followers and to our generation. And he, he talked about that a lot and he lived that way. I was around enough of it. I heard kids I can preach more than any other preacher in my life ever since I was a kid. Thank God I did. I'm so glad I was a, a Hagenite and still am. And, um, but he lived that and taught that. If people would listen to him talk that way and actually Forget all the junk about him, all the rumors of him. Just hear what he says and do it. You will have a great life in ministry. He lived that way uh, and, and died, died well. Yeah. I mean, he, it, it is, you know, his followers caused some problems, but it wasn't him. You know, <laughs> yeah. so we all have that issue. Yeah, that's true. So that's where the, some of the controversies come from is that the second voice, people taking things he said too 
an extreme that he never would. Well, and one thing <clears> that uh, Brother Hagen really did well, I remember with Jack Coe, he goes, Jack Coe died at 38, <clears throat> yeah. but he called him out and said, if you don't stop this, you're, you know, you're gonna die. He said once or twice, or I think yeah. try to get to him. Wasn't the last time he said he knew it was too late and he wouldn't listen, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah, It's very sad that, that people need to learn how to listen to other people. People only want to listen to people that are famous. And I've tried to fix it in my heart. That is a huge statement. That is so true. People only, well, because I've known, and you and I both know that we won't name people that are, they don't submit themselves to somebody because they, they feel like they're at the top of the game. Yeah. And probably because of the gift, not because of the walk. Right. Wow, yeah. that's, that's a big statement right there. And we have to make the adjustment right. to hear God's voice in anybody's voice. So. I don't listen to a certain prophet. I don't have this guy that I'm connected sure. to. That if I hear the sound, I know the sound of the Lord's voice. And if I hear it through the granny or the usher or the famous preacher, I listen. So I'm trying to be addicted to the voice, not to who the voice comes through. So, so just a thought. How do we, how do people watching, they're listening to you, they're going, yeah, I know that sounds right. How do I learn to listen to that voice? How do I recognize that voice? You learn his voice through the scriptures first. And then you learn his voice by the inner witness inside. And as you develop it, then you could hear it. It took me a while to hear it. Yeah. There was, in fact, the Brother Hagin's book on how to be led by the Holy Spirit. He's, he brings up the point that what worked for him the most was that inward witness. Yeah. Called it the inward witness, that voice. You know, that well, that's speaks. the normal way God talks to us today. We all want the audible voice. And that, to me, is a very rare happening, the inner witness. I think you can become so sensitive inside that the inner witness sounds audible. Right. That's what happens because it sounds audible, but no one else heard it. So it was more inward than it was outward. So being sensitive to that is though it's going to require how to hear. How do you hear somebody's voice? If I didn't listen to you or talk to you, I wouldn't know when you called that it was you on the other end. Yep. So that's really good. That's that's a great truth. And, and God likes to talk. He does like to talk to people. If you just be quiet and listen, He'll talk to you. It's amazing what he'll tell you. <laughs> Sometimes it's shocking. Yeah. You know, how, how, what he says. So what do we take from, um, before we move on past John G. Lake, what is it that we should take um, well, I think from, from, from his life? If you, had to, if you had to sum it all up, what would you take? I think the, the, um, the development of his private life that supported his gift, that kept him healthy doctrinally all the way to the end, I think, too, um, a lesson that may be a little more challenging uh, was he had a challenge of being a family man. He had a, he had a wife and had children. His first wife died. And sometimes ministry pulls you so much. And his daughter Gertrude said he was a wonderful dad, but we didn't get enough time with him because he was gone a lot. But after his first wife's death, he made some adjustments, but that still that pull was in him. So I always say as a second lesson from Lake is, because if you don't know the story, his first wife in South Africa died of malnutrition and exhaustion. And uh, so that was a very tragic time in his life. He recovered from it. He made some adjustments, but his daughter said he still had the, the struggle of the, the go and the stay, which I think every family man does. And so that would be another aspect. So if you want a wife, you have to take time to have a wife. If you want children, you've got to take time to have children and do that. So it doesn't belittle you. It just means you have to manage things differently, and some things you won't be able to do as quick or as fast as you like because you have responsibilities. And so if you don't want the responsibilities, then don't create the family or create the babies because yeah. it's not someone else's job to raise them. They're yours. So, oh, Robert, you're so hard. I know I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I just don't want people in ministry to have a great ministry and their families a disaster, which has been the trait. That's true. Both in the evangelical and the charismatic world, Pentecostal world. So if we can suggest things or use people we admire and say, hey, here's a point. It may not be as exciting as 100,000 miracles documented, but it is a point that if you can fix it, you can last and have a good, I mean, we love the stories of the children that do obey the Lord. Right. And we all said when we found out some of them didn't do well. That's true. And when you, when you research it, it's because home life was not dealt with. Lake made the changes, but there still was the struggle there. But he, he lived the life, and he gave us a, an example of how to do ministry and healing. And the healing rooms today are all over the world. And amazing. And they are successful. I remember I've been to the countries. They're there. They're good with the local churches, a good reputation. And that's the ex extension 
of John G. Lake's yes, ministry John. today. It lives and it's worldwide. So it's beautiful. So y- you actually, I had forgotten that until you just said it a minute ago, that you actually got to meet Gertrude. So tell me about her, his daughter. Well, I met his daughter, John G. Lake's daughter, Gertrude, and her son, his son-in-law, Wilf- Wilford and Gertrude, real nice old-timey names, Wilford and Gertrude. I was, uh, I met them uh, when I was probably 16, 17, 18 in that, in that time period. And uh, I got the privilege one time of driving them from Ken Hagen's office to Oral Roberts' office. So I had that, what, 10 mile, you know, yep. drive there. So that was the time I had my first deeper encounter with them. And, and she began to talk. And she um, was concerned that people didn't understand his life that gave him the power. When, when, the, when I was talking about what was the key to your dad's success, what, what, you lived with him, you saw him at breakfast, you saw him at dinner, you were in the meetings with him before and after. He said, she said, he lived what he said, and, and if he didn't do right or something, he was real hard on himself, that he should not have done that, and he make sure that doesn't happen again. And he would come to us and talk to us about those kind of things, even as young adults. Really? Wow. So he, she said that about him. Uh, she said that he was um, a man that was the tallest worker. He just worked all the time. And, um, and that was a part of the family challenge that she spoke about. He loved what he did. And we all do, and that's the problem. We love what we sure, do. Sure, of course. Uh, and she talked about that going with him on trips was like each child's highlight to be with dad in the car and the meetings, and he would try to do that kind of thing. So she talked about that. And they themselves did not have a strong healing ministry themselves, which was interesting. They had a very strong prayer ministry, an intercessor type oh, of, both of them, they wrote books about intercession and things. And I heard them speak a few times, and their main thing was, praying for the harvest, praying for the revival, praying for the move of God on the earth. And that seemed to be their ministry. And um, here's a, I want to say a sad thing. She was just gaining, Billy Brim had discovered her also and, and began to bring her into the, the Word of Faith revival sure. world. And she was gaining recognition. Oh, this is Lake's daughter and son on when people were inviting them. And she got sick and died. Now, she got sick. She got sick of something that could have been fixed by walking into a doctor's office, thirty minutes, and walking out, and, and she should be okay. She did not believe, or they did not believe in any medicine or any doctors at all. And so, when she died, this was the conclusion I had that she had her daddy's doctor, but not her daddy's faith to live in that level of that doctrine. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yes, it does. And so, I think a point we can make with with that is you, you see where people live, and you know how the doctrines they live that, that lifestyle by, but you have to build your faith to operate in the full capacity of some of those doctrines. And I, she would not go to the doctor at all. And uh, some of the early Pentecostals were like anti. And the reason why they were anti-doctors in the early days, I doubt it preached against them, was because they were still a practicing type of medicine. It was very barbaric. I don't think they would say the same thing today, but back in the 1800s or 1900s, folks, it was not good medicine. So they would preach, or Dowdy preached because he saw after surgery how worse the patients were. And he said, it's better for you to die without doctors and just trust God. And that's why he preached again. So early Pentecostals heard Dowdy's preaching and that kind of thing got to going. And it was probably a little more correct for that time, but not today. And she had that belief, and she died because she had got something fixed in 30 minutes, wow. and then just numb it and fix it. Yeah. And she wouldn't do it because it was against Daddy's faith. That's what she said. So interesting not, that she called it Daddy's faith. Yeah. That that says it all right there. That tells the story. So it's good to see where they're at, but know how they got there, and you have to pay the same price privately to get those things to work. You know, Oral Roberts said something in the <clears throat> early 70s that I, I remember. Uh, him saying this so long ago, which was at that time, it was kind of on the tail end of a lot of that thought process. And he said, take your faith with you to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like, oh, it's okay. So like when you take that prescription, take it in faith. Yeah. Pray over it as you take it. So, I mean, you know, even he had to deal with some of that in his ministry coming out of that uh, understanding where people were. I think some of them, they, they, I like what Ken Hagen said. He says, doctors have kept me alive long enough not to need them anymore. Kind of caught it. He, goes, <laughs> yeah. he goes, no, no, in my life, there's some things I can get prayed for. I can get healed. I don't need a doctor. There are some things I need a pill and a shot. I'm not there yet. 
but I'm not staying there. So I think we have to keep growing and pushing toward that and realizing that medicine is another way that God heals. It is. It's not undermining divine healing. They work together. That's right. And so it's, it's good that we can put them together. Yeah, it is. All right, yeah. so taking the last three, four minutes of the program, I want you to pray for the people. Let's talk. We've been talking about healing. Of course, we've been talking about John G. Lake mainly. But why don't you pray for the people, Amen. Roberts, and, and for healing. I think there's a lot of people out there that would receive yeah. that. Father, we ask you today to do what you did when you walked around the shores of Galilee. You healed the sick and the oppressed. We ask that same Jesus to come into the homes of the people today that are sick, some with minor ailments, some with major difficulties. Those two things are never a problem for you. Jesus, you made our bodies. You know how to fix them. And we ask you today to touch people and heal them of their ailments, their diseases. And I remove medical word curses off of their bodies and out of their minds. We remove the power of medical statements that are supposed to be facts. And we remove the power of that in the name of Jesus. And we say, Jesus is your healer. I'm the God that healeth thee. Let those words dominate in their home and their mind. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now listen, if you've prayed with Roberts and you're like, you know, I need a little bit more. Maybe I need something to help me. You can call the phone number. It's 1-877-281-6297 right here at KCM. We have licensed prayer ministers on the other end of that phone. They will pray with you. They'll give you scriptures. And in certain cases, they'll even give you some product they'll send to you for free to help you in your walk, even some downloaded uh, some downloads that you can download. So pick up the phone and call. Don't, it's a free call. There's no charge for anything. 877-281-6297. And let the person know that you prayed with Roberts Lairdon on Revival Radio TV while they were having a revival chat. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Okay, so we've got like a couple minutes. I want to wrap this up. <clears throat> How do you, do you think we're going to see this? I'm asking your opinion. Do you think we're going to see the bold miracle ministry like John G. Lake had? Do you think we're going to see that again? Or is it, do you, I, I'm not saying we're living in cessationism, but, you know, it seems like we don't see that. We don't, or don't hear about it, uh, or we hear about it in other countries. You don't hear about it in America. Well, do you think we're going to see that? Is that I, I think it's already in the earth, but it's harder in the Western countries. And I think in America, Wigglesworth said, he said, I see the healing ministry of the future having difficulty because there's so many other remedies by which people will seek cures. And I think that's because we've got it all here in America. The best doctors, the best everything. And so we don't rely on faith in Christ alone. It's one of our remedies. Maybe the last one, when the doctors don't work and we're going to die, all right, we'll try Jesus. Why don't we go first? Yeah, that's, that's, I love that's that. Go first. Yeah. Go to the Word. Built so many great, thank you, Roberts, for, for this today. That's this is good. good. Yeah, and you can get this uh, wherever books are sold. Amazon, wherever. Get The Miracle Ministry of John G. Lake. Don't go away. We'll see you next week right here on Revival Radio TV.